Assessing a critically ill patient's cardiopulmonary function is essential to effective shock resuscitation and restoration of end organ perfusion and function. Invasive pressure monitoring in the critically ill provides valuable information to the clinician who must identify pathophysiologic abnormalities and initiate appropriate resuscitative therapy. We use calculations of a patient's preload, contractility, and afterload to guide these resuscitative efforts. Let's begin by discussing the five reasons that we monitor critically ill patients. The first is to generate physiologic data so that we can understand the patient's moment-to-moment -moment cardiac function. The second is to guide our resuscitative interventions. Without hemodynamic data, we cannot determine when our interventions are effective or not. The third is to identify and intervene before patients can progress from organ dysfunction, which is generally reversible, to organ failure, which is not. The fourth is to allow early detection of potentially detrimental changes in a patient's physiology. Lastly, the fifth reason is to identify when changes in our treatment strategy are necessary based upon the patient's improving or deteriorating physiologic state. I am frequently asked, when should I consider invasive hemodynamic monitoring? The reasons we should consider monitoring patients are summarized here. In general, if a patient fails to respond to our resuscitative efforts and is showing signs of worsening shock, organ dysfunction, or failure, we should consider invasive hemodynamic monitoring so that we have a better idea of how sick the patient is. We should also consider hemodynamic monitoring in patients who have pre-existing cardiopulmonary disease or those who are at high risk for developing critical illness, as monitoring these patients can help to prevent organ dysfunction and failure. These patients typically don't have much physiologic reserve, and they benefit from optimization of their frequently marginal hemodynamic function. As discussed in the previous podcast, accurate measurement of physiologic variables requires constant vigilance, a thorough understanding of the monitoring principles and pitfalls involved, and the ability to recognize when the hemodynamic data obtained is erroneous. Only then can appropriate application of the information gained lead to therapy that improves patient outcome. Inserting a plastic catheter into a patient doesn't make them better. It is interpreting the data we obtain from the catheter and instituting appropriate therapy that increases their survival. The circulatory system is basically two circuits connected in series. Each circuit has a pump, either the left ventricle or right ventricle, and a resistance either the systemic circulation or the pulmonary circulation. Let's start with some simple hemodynamic calculations. The mean arterial pressure of the systemic circuit is calculated using both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. It averages out the dynamic response artifacts or noise in the systolic and diastolic measurements and should be used to guide vasoactive infusions and other therapies rather than using systolic or diastolic pressures alone. If you are unfamiliar with this concept, you should watch the podcast on dynamic response artifacts. So we now know how to calculate the pressure generated by each pump. This is the outgoing pressure for each circuit. For each circuit, there is also an incoming pressure. We use this pressure to assess the first of the key hemodynamic monitoring questions. What is the patient's preload? For the systemic circuit, the incoming pressure is central venous pressure. For the pulmonary circuit, the incoming pressure is the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. The pressure difference across the circuit is known as its perfusion pressure. Perfusion pressures are vitally important in shock resuscitation, as we will see. The blood that flows around the two circuits is known as the cardiac output. We can use this parameter to assess the patient's preload status, as well as the second key hemodynamic monitoring question, what is the patient's contractility? Cardiac output is calculated by multiplying the patient's heart rate times the stroke volume, or volume of blood ejected from the heart with each beat. You will note that we are using indexed variables here. Cardiac index, rather than cardiac output, 
and stroke volume index rather than stroke volume. Let's take a quick break and talk about why indexed variables are so important in hemodynamic monitoring. Consider two patients, A and B. Patient B weighs three times that of patient A. Their body surface areas are thus very different. Both, however, have a cardiac output of four liters per minute. When we calculate each patient's cardiac index, however, taking into consideration each patient's weight, we see that patient B has grossly inadequate cardiac blood flow compared to patient A. For each hemodynamic parameter, it is important that you know its normal range so that you can identify when your patient's hemodynamic function is abnormal. Because of difference in patient size, however, there are no normal ranges for non-indexed variables. So back to cardiac index and contractility. The most common cause of a decreased cardiac index is lack of preload or hypovolemia. We also know this by the term intravascular depletion. This makes sense when you consider how cardiac index is calculated. It can only be affected by changes in either heart rate or stroke volume index. So, to increase cardiac index, we typically give fluids or blood, increase the patient's stroke volume index, and thereby their cardiac index. Decreased cardiac index can also be caused by increased systemic vascular resistance or afterload. More on that a bit later. Cardiac index may also be increased when the heart is hyperdynamic, such as in early septic shock, cirrhosis, pregnancy, or in high-performance athletes. Now the pressures in each circuit can also be used to calculate both the work done by each pump, either the left or right ventricular stroke work index, and the resistance or afterload of each circuit, either the systemic or pulmonary vascular resistance index. The stroke work indices are another way that we can answer the question of whether the patient's contractility is adequate. The vascular resistance indices can be used to answer the third of the primary hemodynamic monitoring questions, what is the patient's afterload? After all those classes you took in physics, you really only need to remember two equations. The first is work equals force times distance. We can use this in patients to calculate the work done by each pump. The force is the change in pressure generated by the pump, while the distance is the volume of blood moved. Remembering this diagram is helpful in determining how to calculate cardiac work. For the left ventricle, work equals the change in pressure, or mean arterial pressure minus pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, times the volume of blood moved, or stroke volume index. To make the units work out right, we have to use a correction factor of 0.0136. A normal left ventricular stroke work index is 43 to 60 grams meters per meter squared. For the right ventricular stroke work index, the equation is the same, except that the pressure difference changes. Now the right ventricle doesn't generate much work, and this parameter is rarely calculated and used clinically. It's important to recognize that inadequate preload and a low stroke volume index will always mathematically result in a low stroke work index. As a result, to interpret the stroke work indices properly, it is important to ensure that the patient's preload status is optimized first. Causes of decreased ventricular stroke work indices thus include low intravascular volume, increased vascular resistance or afterload, and decreased cardiac contractility. The stroke work indices may be increased in the presence of ventricular hypertrophy and physiologic conditioning. The second physics equation that you have to remember is Ohm's law. Voltage equals current times resistance. Rearranging, we get resistance equals voltage divided by current. We can use this to calculate the resistance through each circuit or afterload of each pump. In patients, vascular resistance equals the change in pressure across the circuit divided by the current, or blood flow. Remembering our diagram, the systemic vascular resistance index is thus the change in pressure across the systemic circulation, or mean arterial pressure minus central venous pressure, divided by blood flow or cardiac index. As before, to make the units work outright, we have to use a correction factor of 80.
A normal systemic vascular resistance is 1800 to 24 dynes, seconds, centimeters to the negative fifth. Now the SVRI is an estimate of afterload or resistance to blood being ejected from the left ventricle. Causes of increased systemic vascular resistance include various shock states where the body clamps down and tries to increase its blood pressure in response to critical illness, or the presence of a pheochromocytoma. Decreased systemic vascular resistance indices are common in neurogenic and early distributive shock. Pulmonary vascular resistance index is calculated similarly. It is the change in pressure across the pulmonary circulation, or mean pulmonary arterial pressure, minus pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, again divided by blood flow or cardiac index. A normal pulmonary vascular resistance index is 200 to 350 dynes, seconds, centimeters to the negative fifth. It is an estimate of the afterload imposed upon the right ventricle. Causes of increased pulmonary vascular resistance include pulmonary hypertension, acute respiratory distress syndrome, the presence of elevated intra pressures, valvular stenosis, and left heart failure. Decreased pulmonary vascular resistance index is common in a variety of shock states. As mentioned earlier, the perfusion pressure across the circuit is the pressure coming in minus the pressure going out. The perfusion pressure across an organ or body region is usually more important than the inflow pressure alone. If the perfusion pressure is too low, the organ in question may not be receiving enough blood flow and therefore receives inadequate oxygen delivery. This can lead to organ dysfunction and failure. During shock resuscitation, we are especially interested in the perfusion pressures of the brain, the heart, and the abdomen. Perfusion of the heart is a primary goal in any resuscitation, especially in patients with pre-existing cardiac disease. Without adequate myocardial blood flow, the heart will not pump properly and contractility will be decreased. Diastolic blood pressure is the inflow pressure to the coronary arteries. As myocardial blood flow through the left ventricle primarily occurs during diastole, we use pulmonary artery occlusion pressure to estimate coronary outflow pressure. Coronary perfusion pressure is therefore diastolic blood pressure minus pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. This should be maintained above 50 millimeters of mercury. I thus become very concerned whenever I see a patient with a diastolic blood pressure less than 50 millimeters of mercury, especially if they are elderly, as their coronary perfusion pressure is, by definition, already inadequate. Perfusion of the brain is an important parameter in the patient with traumatic brain injury or elevated intracranial pressure. Mean arterial pressure is the inflow pressure to the brain. Central venous pressure, or intracranial pressure, whichever is higher, is the outflow pressure. Cerebral perfusion pressure is therefore mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. Cerebral perfusion pressure should be maintained between 50 and 70 millimeters of mercury. This can be achieved either by increasing mean arterial pressure using fluids or vasopressors, or decreasing intracranial pressure with hypertonic fluids, osmotic diuretics, ventricular drainage, or decompressive craniectomy. Maintaining adequate cerebral perfusion pressures is associated with improved long-term patient outcome. Perfusion of the abdominal organs is an important parameter in any critically ill patient. Mean arterial pressure is the inflow pressure to the abdomen. Central venous pressure, or intra-abdominal pressure, whichever is higher, is the outflow pressure. Abdominal perfusion pressure is thus mean arterial pressure minus intra-abdominal pressure. Abdominal perfusion pressure should be maintained above 50 millimeters of mercury to ensure adequate visceral perfusion and function. This can be achieved by either increasing the mean arterial pressure using fluids or vasopressors, or decreasing intra-abdominal pressure through either a variety of medical interventions or surgically through a decompressive laparotomy. Maintaining adequate abdominal perfusion pressures is also associated with improved patient survival. So for any critically ill patient, you now know how to answer the three primary hemodynamic monitoring questions. First, is their preload or intravascular volume status adequate? Second, is their cardiac contractility adequate to meet their demands at the moment? Third, 
is their afterload or systemic vascular resistance to outflow from the heart appropriate for their current physiologic state? These are questions that you should ask whenever you are evaluating a patient in the ICU. Now there is a reason that we use the term cardiopulmonary. The first three questions address the patient's cardiac status. With regard to hemodynamic monitoring, however, assessing their pulmonary status requires that we answer a fourth question. Is oxygen transport balance adequate? Are we delivering enough oxygen at the cellular level to avoid anaerobic metabolism and worsening shock? This last question is the subject of an entire SCC talk in and of itself.